In World War II, there was a weapon so crazy that military experts laughed it out of the room. A four-ton bomb that bounces across water like a skipping stone to hit targets that couldn't be reached any other way. On May 16, 1943, this impossible weapon silenced every doubter by smashing through Germany's most protected dams in a single devastating night. This British engineer had an idea so ridiculous that it defied every law of physics anyone understood. But there's a dark secret behind this brilliant success that explains why it was never repeated. And by the end of this video, you'll understand how sometimes the most ridiculous ideas turn out to be the most revolutionary. To understand why anyone would even think of bouncing a bomb, we need to travel back to Nazi Germany's industrial heartland, the Ruhr Valley. This region was absolutely crucial to Hitler's war machine. It was a home to massive hydroelectric dams that supply water and electricity to factories fueling the Nazi war effort. Destroying these dams could cripple German industry, disrupt transport, and deal a psychological blow to the enemy. But there's a problem. These dams are not only immense, built of thick concrete and designed to withstand massive force, but they're also protected by underwater torpedo nets. Think about it from a bomber pilot's perspective. You're flying at high altitude, trying to hit a narrow concrete wall while German anti-aircraft guns are shooting at you. Even if you somehow managed a direct hit, conventional bombs would just bounce off or explode harmlessly against the massive concrete structure. And forget about torpedo attacks. The Germans had stretched underwater nets across the reservoirs specifically to stop that approach. These dams seemed absolutely impregnable. The German engineers who built them probably thought they were safe from any aerial attack. They were wrong, and it was all thanks to one man's brilliant, slightly crazy idea. This is where Barnes Wallace enters the story. He wasn't your typical weapons designer. Born in 1887, this British engineer had spent his career thinking outside the box in ways that would make modern innovators jealous. Before the war, Wallace had revolutionized aircraft design with his geodetic construction method, basically a basket weave pattern of metal that made planes incredibly strong, yet lightweight. His Wellington bomber could take massive battle damage and still bring crews home safely. But Wallace wasn't content with just building better planes. He was a strategic thinker who believed that precision attacks on critical infrastructure could be more effective than carpet bombing entire cities. When he looked at those German dams, he didn't see an impossible target. He saw a physics problem waiting to be solved. Here's where it gets interesting. Wallace's breakthrough didn't come from studying military textbooks. It came from watching his children skip stones across a pond in his garden. Wallace realized that if he could control the physics of stone skipping, the angle, the speed, the spin, he might be able to make a bomb bounce across water and reach targets that conventional weapons couldn't touch. It sounds simple when you put it like that, but turning this backyard observation into a working weapon would require solving problems that had never been tackled before. When you skip a stone across water, several forces are at play. The stone hits the water at a shallow angle, and the water's resistance creates an upward force that lifts it back into the air. But here's the key. It only works if you get the angle, speed, and spin just right. Wallace discovered that the secret ingredient was backspin. Just like a tennis player putting backspin on a drop shot, the bomb needed to rotate backwards as it flew through the air. This backspin served multiple crucial purposes. It stabilized the bomb's flight path, helped it bounce more consistently, and here's the brilliant part. When the bomb finally hit the dam wall, the residual spin would make it roll down the face of the dam underwater, 
positioning it perfectly for maximum destructive effect. Through extensive testing, Wallace calculated the exact parameters needed for success. The bomb had to be dropped from precisely 60 feet above the water surface, with the aircraft traveling at exactly 232 miles per hour. The bomb needed to spin at 500 revolutions per minute and hit the water at a 7-degree angle. Get any of these numbers wrong, and the whole thing would fail spectacularly. But the real genius was in understanding underwater explosions. When a bomb explodes underwater, especially when it's in direct contact with a structure, the water acts as a conductor for the shock waves. The explosion creates what Wallace called the bubble pulse effect. Repeated shock waves that can exploit tiny cracks in concrete and cause catastrophic structural failure. Turning this idea into reality was no easy feat. The bomb, codenamed Upkeep, was massive, over 9,000 pounds, packed with torpex, originally designed for torpedoes because it created a longer, more devastating blast underwater. Torpex was a specialized mixture of 42% RDX, 40% TNT, and 18% aluminum powder designed specifically for a longer, more powerful underwater blast pulse. But here's where the engineering gets really clever. The bomb had not one, but multiple ways to explode. The primary detonation system used three hydrostatic pistols, the same type used in depth charges, that were set to trigger when the bomb reached exactly 30 feet underwater. But what if something went wrong? Wallace thought of that too. There was also a backup 90-second time fuse that would automatically arm itself the moment the bomb left the aircraft. Backspin was non-negotiable for stability and trajectory control. He achieved this with a Vickers Jassy hydraulic motor mounted beside the bomb, powered by the Lancaster's hydraulic system. To prevent the bomb from getting dented during its multiple high-velocity impacts with water, which could throw off its underwater trajectory, engineers encased it in phenolic resin expanded into a protective foam. Each bomb was even individually balanced on a test rig just like balancing car wheels, with small weights added to eliminate any vibration that could affect its spin. This technical masterpiece had to work perfectly on the first try. There were no second chances and no room for mechanical failure. By early 1943, they had a working design that could bounce over 20 times and travel more than a thousand yards across water, an astonishing feat of engineering under wartime pressure. And all of this had to be accomplished in just 80 days, racing against the clock to be ready when the dams were at their fullest. But inventing the bomb was only half the battle. To deliver such a massive specialized weapon, the Royal Air Force needed to modify its largest bomber, the Avro Lancaster. Engineers had to remove the bomb bay doors entirely and install a special cradle system with V-shaped arms to hold the massive cylinder. The mid-upper gun turret was removed to save weight and make room for the spinning mechanism. Even the radios were swapped for newer models to ensure clear communication during the low-altitude attack runs. These changes turned the Lancaster into a purpose-built delivery system tailored for a single high-stakes mission. Dropping the bouncing bomb required nerves of steel and precision flying. The margin for error was razor thin. Too high, and the bomb would sink. Too low, and it would crash into the water. On the night of May 16, 17, 1943, 19 specially modified Lancaster bombers took off from RAF Scampton in Lincolnshire. The mission, codenamed Operation Chest Eyes, began. Leading them was 24-year-old Wing Commander Guy Gibson, commanding the newly formed 617 Squadron, known as the Dam Busters, a unit that had existed for just eight weeks and was created specifically for this mission. The crews were a multinational group of elite airmen, British, Canadian, Australian, New Zealand, and American pilots, navigators, and gunners, all hand-picked for their exceptional skills. They had trained intensively for low-level night flying, 
but even they didn't know their exact target until the night of the mission. Flying at just 100 feet above the ground to avoid radar detection, these crews navigated across occupied Europe in the dark, often flying below treetop level. When they reached their targets, they had to drop even lower, to just 60 feet above the water surface, while maintaining precise speed and heading toward heavily defended dams. The attack was as daring as it was dangerous. Lancasters swooped in over the reservoirs, hugging the water at terrifyingly low altitudes. Bombs were released with split-second timing, skipping across the surface, evading torpedo nets, and slamming into the dam walls. When the Mona Dam broke, it released 330 million tons of water in a torrent 33 feet high, traveling at 15 miles per hour through the valley below. The Eder Dam fell next, unleashing another 200 million tons of water. The Sorpa Dam, built differently with an earthen core, was damaged but held. The immediate results were devastating. Factories were destroyed, power stations wiped out, transportation networks washed away. Steel production in the Ruhr region dropped to one quarter of its previous level. Two major hydroelectric plants were completely destroyed leaving the region without power for two weeks. But victory came at a terrible cost. Eight of the 19 aircraft were lost, and 53 of the 133 airmen who participated were killed, a casualty rate of over 40%. So, was Operation Chastise the war-changing success it appeared to be? The answer is complicated. In the short term, absolutely. The raid caused massive disruption, provided a huge morale boost for the Allies, and demonstrated that even Germany's most protected targets weren't safe from British ingenuity. But the long-term strategic impact was more limited than hoped. German repair efforts were remarkably efficient, most water production was restored within six weeks, and the dams themselves were rebuilt within 11 weeks. Albert Speer, Hitler's armaments minister, later acknowledged that while the raid was brilliant, the Germans were puzzled that the British didn't follow up with conventional attacks during the repair period, which could have prolonged the disruption significantly. The human cost was also sobering. Over 1,600 people died in the flooding, including about 600 Germans and 1,000 enslaved laborers, mainly Soviet prisoners of war. These casualties raise difficult questions about the ethics of strategic bombing, even against legitimate military targets. Perhaps most tellingly, the bouncing bomb was never used operationally again. The combination of extreme precision requirements, high casualty rates, and the element of surprise being lost made it unsuitable for repeated use. Yet, the true legacy of the bouncing bomb and Operation Chastise goes far beyond the physical destruction. It demonstrated the power of precision strikes against hardened targets, a concept that would shape the future of aerial warfare and specialized munitions. Barnes Wallace's invention inspired generations of engineers and military planners. The Dam Busters became legends, their story told in books, films, and popular culture a testament to courage, ingenuity, and the willingness to try the impossible. The story of Barnes Wallace and his bouncing bomb reminds us that innovation often comes from the most unlikely places. A simple observation about stone skipping became a weapon that breached the unbombable, a backyard experiment became a strategic game changer, and an impossible idea became one of the most famous military operations in history. While Operation Chastise may not have single-handedly won World War II, it demonstrated something equally important, that human ingenuity, scientific rigor, and extraordinary courage can overcome seemingly impossible challenges. So if you want to dive deeper into these hidden engineering marvels and the brilliant minds behind them, make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell. The world of World War II technology is packed with mind-blowing stories, and we're just getting started uncovering these forgotten pieces of history that shaped our modern world.